we are live okay good evening everybody welcome welcome to association of indian primatologists so and we are here with the uh, dr anna nikaris today to give you a short feedback a short introduction about the topic we are all aware of how social media can provide great insights into how people interact with nature most people enjoy the outdoors with the camera and often share their photos and videos on networking sites with instagram facebook and twitter generating plenty of information about the earth efforts to protect creatures has changed over the period of time now that you can scroll on your smartphone to learn about the environment and endangered animals it could be easy to support wildlife but the connection between social media and wildlife conservation isn't simple photos comments and videos can lead citizens to form their own opinions about the rescue methods protection of public lands and habitat policies with a range of people using these platforms both positive and negative effects come out of social media and wildlife conservation one of the biggest negative effect being the increase in wildlife trafficking on this note let me introduce our speaker for today professor anna nikaris who is very popularly known as the queen fire face is indeed the queen of the nocturnal primate research by day She is a professor and course tutor for MSc Primate Conservation course at uh, Oxford Brookes University and a supervisor to more than 60 PhDs grads and undergrad students. At night she is the director of the Little Fireface project and a convener of the uh, Nocturnal Primate Research Group. Anna has scanned all Lawrence lands and her research on lorises ranges from behavioral ecology in zoos rescue centers and in the wild in museum studies genetics acoustics taxonomy conservation education and even on venom did you know that slow lorises are the only primate that have venom i mean she knows better than any one of us anna is also a co a co editor in chief of folia primatologica which is a journal of the european society of primatology let us hear from her anna thank you very much i think it's one of the nicest introductions i've ever had and it's a huge um privilege to be able to be able to talk to the association of indian primatologists i did my phd in india i did my masters research in india i first went to india in 1994 and it really started my journey for studying asia's lorises at that time it was slender lorises Today I'm going to mainly be talking about slow lorises, and um, is it okay to start the talk then? Is that what we do now? I guess I just start my talk. I've got a thumbs up, so I'm going to share my screen. Oops, I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, you're going to see my share my screen, and then I do this one. There we go. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, some case studies regarding the impacts of social media on illegal trade. I'm going to be focusing on primates, but there are going to be some other animals in my talk as well, especially uh, some small carnivores. If you're interested in communicating with me about any of these topics, my email address is there, and it will also appear at the end. It's info at littlefireface.org. So. Um so what's very interesting is that humans are humans love animals humans are animals humans relate to various animals they see around them and now that we have such a huge presence of media in our lives it's no um surprise that just like we want to buy products we're interested in acquiring the animals we see on social media or seeing them or relating to them and that's not just social media it's film adverts photographs all of these things and if we just look at a little history of um consequences of media on animal conservation we can go back uh, to 1993 where after the showing of the film Jurassic Park we saw a huge number of imports as iguanas as pets and other releases of reptiles into the wild uh some of these are interesting um cause or correlations we don't know that Jurassic Park actually caused this but we could see correlations between certain films and these sort of activities 
If we look in 1996, we do have a few, bit of data after 101 Dalmatians was shown as a film with the number of Dalmatians arriving in animal shelters uh, doubling in 1997. If we move on, Finding Nemo, a, a very cute aquarium fish, a clownfish, uh, it became very, very popular, causing enormous overharvesting. By 2005, its import into the U US as an ornamental fish. So what was very interesting is this was a film that was about pet trade and about conservation in some respects, yet it still could cause overharvesting. Here you see a celebrity with exotic pets and with just a normal animal, a chihuahua. Chihuahuas look really small and cute. They're actually very energetic dogs. They could be difficult to care for. And if we look at a, a celebrity like Paris Hilton, who shows beautiful photographs of herself with a domestic pet like a chihuahua or an exotic pet like a kinkajou, we could see the same effect. Either those domestic animals become more popular and abandoned, or we see the increase, potential increase or a correlated increase in trade of the wild animal. If we now go on to the slow lorises, I'm going to introduce the case of Sonia. I remember sitting in my office back in 2009 when this video of a, of a little pygmy slow loris in a Russian flat went viral and thinking, oh my gosh, this is sort of the end of slow lorises. Um, and this is Sonia, the tickle lover. It's taken from the internet. It's a little bit blurry. But uh, here she is with her arms up in the air. What you'll see underneath her arms are bald patches of skin. This is where the venom gland of the slow loris is. When these animals are stressed, they release a lot more venom and they can get hair loss in that area. This is also the typical defense posture that lorises use before they're going to bite you. But it was perceived as being incredibly cute. And this video went viral, um, potentially fuel fueling the international pet trade. We looked at this video for a number of years, for about five years as it was online, and we looked at 12, more than 12,000 comments uh, that we analyzed to try to look at the impact of this video, as well as conservation interventions that we undertook during the life of the video, including, for example, getting not only a slow loris page uploaded to Wikipedia, but getting it on the front page of Wikipedia, doing a, a major international film about these threats to slow lorises, as well as just getting huge amounts of information out there using social media. And so uh, this is an open access article in PLOS One. So if you're interested in this topic, you can have a look at that article, but here are some of the data from it. What's very interesting, slow lorises indeed are the only venomous primates. Um, their venom is produced through uh, oil in their upper arm called the brachial gland. The gland in their upper arm produces oil. It's mixed with saliva in their mouth. It, pr it produces a very interesting molecule, most similar to something called FELD1, which is uh, also in cat allergen. But interestingly, in other slow lorises, this causes incredible uh, infection, necrotic skin, even death. It causes death in small invertebrates. And in humans, it could cause anaphylactic shock and death. So in order to prevent lorises being pets in the pet or being venomous in the pet trade, their teeth are often pulled out because the venom is delivered through an interesting set of teeth that have grooves in the back that allow the venom to move upwards to be injected into the victim. So this is actually a very cool fact in a way about an animal. And if you can see over time from 2009, when the video was uploaded, till 2012 when we collected the data, you could see teeth pulled out became much more common and known in the comments. People saying things like, it's so cruel, this video is really bad, this animal probably has its teeth pulled out. Being poisonous and venomous also became better known by the end, especially in 2012 after an international film was released focusing on the venom of the slow loris. But interestingly as well, in many countries in Southeast Asia, including Cambodia, Myanmar, and China. Lorises are one of the most important animals in traditional medicines with over 100 uses. And this is their main threat in those countries. Yet this did not actually hit the radar because this was about pet trade. And that threat actually didn't increase in knowledge because of that video. Here you could see as well, early on, when that video first appeared, many, many people were saying, I want one. These are a percentage of about these 12,000 700 comments. Uh, and although there was a little bit of knowledge about animals being illegal early on, illegal and endangered became a more predominant comment in the later years. 
uh, with I want one still being present in amongst 10% of the comments, but statistically decreasing until February 2012, when the main video of that Sonia the Tickle Lover was removed from YouTube. Sadly, many sister copies of that video still remain, and there are still people sharing and loving that video and thinking Sonia the Tickle Lover is the cutest thing they've ever seen. Some of these people are, um, this is a bit blurry, this is a direct cut and cut and paste from that plus one paper, but these are celebrities ranging from Stephen Fry to Ricky Gervais, who were sharing that video thinking how cute it was. It does look cute. And so unless you know the background, when these animals are decontextualized and start to appear in people's houses, you don't feel, you're not able to get the conservation message. And you would think, for example, here you see Ariana Grande, a famous singer in 2011, who had responded, she would get a slow loris and name it after her fan. Um, she's still promoting slow lorises as pets. Here's Rihanna in 2013, already a whole year after that video was taken down, um, to doing photo prop trade in Thailand. And here's Ariana Grande's I don't actually know where she's taking that photo, but it says current mood texting, her mother's texting with a lemur in her hands. So this is 2017. And after all of this outreach, we still have celebrities thinking it's appropriate to have slow lorises as pets or as photo props taking photos with them. So why is this? We have a cute response when we see um, little cute animals with chubby bodies, large foreheads, um, round faces. I just realized I hadn't turned on my timer. And, uh, and I think we could see in that photograph there with Hello Kitty and Pokemon, two very cute iconic images. If you draw a line down the center of their face, the slow loris is very, very similar with these very wide eyes. And there was an interesting study back in 2012 of when you see a cute animal or a cute human baby, you just want to like cuddle it and go, oh, it's so cute. And you squeeze your hands and you squeeze your face. And um, it's something that we feel when we see these animals. And when we write, I want one, maybe we don't really want one. But what we're going to see in this talk is that it, these videos are fueling an international illegal trade. So today, I'm going to show you four case studies that uh, myself and my PhD students, master students, and our research group has done at out of Oxford Brookes University to examine the effects of social media on pet trade. I'm gonna be focusing on three major platforms, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So this is a Java slow loris. This is the, the species we're studying in the wild in uh, Java, Indonesia. It's critically endangered, one of the most endangered primates on earth, mainly endangered because of the pet trade. Although habitat loss has horrific impacts on its population, it does very well in secondary habitats, and it would be fine if people would just stop capturing them for the pet trade, at least for the time being. So um, here are these case studies. The first one is looking at um, wild animals and exotic pets on YouTube. So what we wanted to look at were different types of animals. So some carnivores, some primates, uh, including the slow loris is a nocturnal primate, neotropical primates like the capuchin monkey, you see there, squirrel monkey, you see there, you see meerkats, kinkajous, and ring-tailed lemurs. And we wanted to look at zoo videos um, and wild videos, and then when those animals are an exotic pet in the home. And we looked at the most uh, viewed videos in each of those topics for each species. And we looked at the number of views, the comments made, and the type of comments to see if the scenario affected how people perceived those animals. The second case study is looking at if these videos really are cruel. So the number of emails and messages I've gotten about Sonia, the tickle lover, she looks so happy. Those people really love her. Um, look how cute she looks. She looks really well fed or all of these kind of things. When we're looking at videos, most of the time we're looking at 10 seconds to one minute in the life of that animal. Maybe most of the time it's in a cage. Maybe most of the time it's in, a, in inappropriate conditions. But even in that one minute or so of a video we see, we wanted to know if the, the five animal freedoms that, for example, um, the Royal Society for the Protection of Animals uses here in the UK. And here I have uh, the Humane Australia five freedoms. They're all the same. Freedom from hunger and thirst. So 
even if the animal was provided food, is it the right food? Freedom from discomfort. Slow lorises are tree dwellers, they're slow climbers, they rarely come to the ground, they're always holding onto branches, they're very uncomfortable on flat surfaces. So are they given the appropriate substrates? Freedom from pain, injury, and disease is their evident illness in these videos. Freedom to express normal behavior. So can that animal move around? Slow lorises are actually social, they live in small groups, they live in pairs with their offspring, up to three to four offspring at a time. And so an animal on its own is already going to be not normal, but other aspects of normal behavior. You'll have a look when I give you some examples. And fear and distress. So does the animal actually look stressed? Is it exhibiting a fear response? Or is there a person or like having a little chihuahua dog poking it in the loris's face as an example? The next example is going on to Facebook. And we were looking at something called the anthropogenic alley effect. And so what's very interesting is people place extra value on rarity. Even if you're going to sell a simple item on your online shop, if you say it's almost sold out, you have to get it now, it creates a sense of urgency and people want these rare objects. So we know that exotic animals are considered more rare and threatened animals may also be considered more rare and they may become more expensive. So for 18 months, uh, we looked at Facebook and this was done by our PhD student, Pentai Sierawat. Um, and she was searching in Thai on Thai Facebook channels. So this is focused on Thailand. For carnivores and primates, what we were interested in to see is if native versus exotic animals, those protected in Thailand by a law called WARPA or internationally by the, the law of CITES uh, influenced people wanting them and their price, particularly in this case, I'm gonna be showing you the price as well as their red list status. Um, and if they were actually available, because sometimes on these websites, we can get you one, they're not available straight away. And this has just been published in the journal for nature conservation. So you can have a look at that. Finally, the last case study is comes from two short papers one in Oryx and one that we just published in a, a book about slow loris conservation and evolution for Cambridge University Press with my master's student, Honors Kitson, Honor Kitson. And we're looking at uh, the slow loris photoprop trade. The slow loris trade is not only happening in Asia, actually it's just started to come here where I am in Europe to Turkey, to Mamaris Beach, which is one of the most popular tourist destinations in Turkey. And we see the same photoprop trade we see in Bali, we see in Thailand happening here in Turkey. And we were interested to know, um, do the slow lorises increase your like currency? Like currency is a new kind of fad on social media. You wanna get as many likes as you can. You might be checking your phone all the time to see if you have likes. We used a, a program called Mixagram where we could search various hashtags to try to isolate photographs. We got 103 photographs in the one year period this work was carried out. And we were looking in particular, uh, for example, how good was the photograph? Is it in focus? Can you actually see the loris? Um, and it, so, so about the person in focus, was it a really attractive person? Was it good lighting? So is it just a really good photograph that makes people like the photograph or is it the slow loris? And as a control, we looked at three photographs before the loris and three photographs after the loris and compared. So those are the four case studies and I'm gonna go into the data now. So these are the results. First, if we look at our wild animals on YouTube, and if we look at kind of stats we have per the different videos, here you have your meerkats and kinkajous, so some small carnivores, ring-tailed lemurs, slow lorises, these are your strepsorine primates, squirrel monkeys and capuchin monkeys, both new world monkeys that are often kept as pets. And here we could look at the, the first five most popular videos and the number of views, the number of comments, and the number of uh, comments of people saying, I want one as a pet. And what's very interesting is if the animal is in captivity as in a zoo, it's very rare for someone to say they want one as a pet. If the animal is already a pet, it's very common and statistically more significant that people say they want it as a pet. So seeing the animal as a pet stimulates people to want it as a pet. Um, whereas when it's again in the wild, it's very rarely wanted as a pet. Interestingly as well, when it is a pet, although it wasn't significant, if we look at the slow loris, there are 18 million views as opposed to 800,000. The reason that's not significant is that was heavily weighted by two videos with a huge number of views. 
but still 17,900 comments versus 454 in zoos, only 32 comments from the most popular wild videos. So one thing I've thought about for the last eight years where I've been running a long-term project in Indonesia on slow lorises is how can I make people love a wild slow loris enough to have 18 million views and 17,000 comments, um, which is largely from a little slow loris eating a rice ball and another one being tickled. And it just is so sad that people would rather see that than a wild animal. So in the Q&A, if you have any advice, we could think about how we can make wild animals just as appealing to people as these pets. Here you could see um, the most popular videos, uh, especially for kinkajous and slow lorises. Sorry, I can't see because um, the most popular ones, they're pets again. And so this is a problem. People just like pet videos more. We also found things like they really like to see an animal eating. They really like to see a wild animal in clothes and they love to see a wild animal in human contact. We're gonna see that more in a bit. And as far as I want one, there was no significant difference in wanting the different species, but we did find a significant difference in the comment want one when it was a pet rather than in the wild or the zoo. And who of course wouldn't want a meerkat sunning itself in front of your fireplace. So they're very, it's a very difficult kind of study to do because you see a lot of animal cruelty that we as biologists would know is animal cruelty. And you see a lot of uh, images that can make you really sad. Um, or a comment like this one. This is about a person who wanted a kinkajou. She was there for me to make my own. We didn't get a dog because there's nothing cool or outstanding about owning a dog, a kinkajou. Now that seems untouchable and who doesn't want the untouchable? They say, don't touch it and you want to touch it. So that's the anthropogenic Ellie effect in place, yeah? Um, if we think about, again, why our reasons, why this might be the case, a few years ago, Steve Ross put forward the idea of the distortion hypothesis, that animals in contact with humans are less likely perceived of as threatened. So the fact that you can touch it means it mustn't be threatened. And, and this kind of study design showed a chimpanzee in just a plain background, a chimpanzee in a human context, a chimpanzee in the wild, but with a human, or a chimpanzee in clothing in a zoo. And it's the second the human was there, even in the wild, it was perceived that these guys could be pets. So we think of lemur tourism, gorilla ecotourism, and all of these, these um, photos where people want to get a two shot, we call it, a photo of you with an animal behind you or an animal in contact with you. If that lemur jumps on you to take something out of your bag, that's your Instagram currency, you're gonna post that photo, but it can make people perceive that they are good pets because since they can be in contact with you, they're not dangerous or whatever the other issues are. Now we even have COVID-19 or these other emerging infectious diseases in play where the minute we have animals in contact with humans like great apes and probably other primates as well, there's more disease risk transmission as well. But, and, and in fact, there was another study that was done trying to see how people could avoid wanting a pet and the only thing that got people not to want them was the possibility they would get a disease from the animal, not that they would give a disease to the animal. Okay, we move on to the second one. Are slow loris videos cruel? Um, and what we, we looked at, we tried to find as many individual slow lorises as possible. So if one uploader has a slow loris channel and uploads 100 videos, we only chose the, the most viewed video from that uploader. So there wasn't any animal that we observed twice. And if somebody uploaded, re-uploaded somebody else's video, we went back to the original when possible or the earliest uploaded. And um, this was published in Folia Primatologica and you can read it if you like. So I wonder if I can move this. I keep not being able to see my slides because I have um, people in the side. So anyway, here we look at the five conditions, those five freedoms. And what's interesting in over a hundred videos, 31 of them, so a, about a quarter of them had all five freedoms violated. There were no videos in which no freedoms were not violated. So every video violated at least, at least one freedom. And if we look at as well, when all five freedoms were violated, more people liked those videos and more people commented on them. 
So an average of 2,000 thumbs up with as many as 41,000, an average of 303 comments with as many as 8,200, which is wild. And these are where the, the ones that make me cry because they're so terrible because everything is going wrong in those videos. If we actually look at a generalized linear model of the data considering the different factors of human contact, if there's light or not, so the animal, the nocturnal animals kept in the daylight, if it's evidently showing a stress position, if it's kept alone, if it's a baby or an older animal, because we predicted maybe they would like babies more, or if it's in these weird unnatural conditions, what we find is the two factors that people like the most are animals very stressed, with very stressed faces, their arms up with that sort of thing, or the light condition. People love to see nocturnal animals in the daylight. And this is actually very interesting because even last week I was working with National Geographic Kids Magazine to put out an article about slow lorises. And I kept asking them, please don't put nocturnal slow lorises in the daylight. You have wonderful photographs of them at night. Why do we have to show a diurnal animal, sorry, a nocturnal animal in the day? But people, we're, we're diurnal. We like to see animals in the lights. We don't like looking in the dark, even if it's a moody, beautiful photograph. And it's crazy that even National Geographic wants to put animals that are nocturnal in the lights. So here you see some of these conditions. Um, here you see daylight, 95%. There's an isolated obese animal at 76%. That daylight animal is eating fruit, which slow lorises don't really eat. It's an extremely small part of their diet. There's a totally stressed out animal that's in a venom position, that's lying on an unnatural surface in the daylight. There's an animal in a horrible cage with nothing to do with a massive um, wound on the side. You can see a bare skin that's weeping. There you see human contact and the animal with very small pupils looking stressed, its hands grasped, it has no stick to hold onto. And if that wasn't unnatural enough, there's a poor Bengal slow loris in a jumper, in a blanket, on a furry rug in the daylight with tiny pupils, with its mouth in a very stressed face. So um, these videos are perceived of as being very cute and people like them. How can we turn that around? Moving on to, well, one of the things we wanted to do was um, try to be able to report these videos as abuse. And this is a little bit of an old figure now because it keeps changing all the time. If you see a loris on so, or any animal, any, any wild animal that's being tortured or domestic animal that's being tortured. Uh, recently, there was a series of um, videos about people putting a cat in a bin and setting it on fire, you know, these terrible kind of videos. There should be, so putting a cat in a bin and setting it on fire, YouTube will accept that as animal cruelty. But having a illegally exported smuggled animal with an open wound in a cage with inappropriate food in the daylight being terrorized by a human is cute and it is not considered cruelty. So I run the Little Fireface Project. We do a lot of this outreach. We give people a lot of opportunities to be able to, um, you know, we, we post some of these videos saying, please everybody, let's try to have a thousand of us tell YouTube to take it down. YouTube will say, it is not cruelty, we will not take it down. It's one reason I actually published the paper, which I called, Is Tickling Torture? Um, to test those five freedoms, to try to provide the public or YouTube or any of these other um, social media sites with actual scientific data that these videos are cruel, even if they look cute. And the only example in here, okay, in the UK we could think of is if I took my dog and I put it on a really thin branch in a tree where it could hardly hold on. It was criminally obese with a big wound in its side and I was feeding it chocolate and poking it. People might think that's animal cruelty. You turn that around with, a, with an exotic animal and it's not perceived of as animal cruelty. And this is something again, we need to try to turn around. Okay, moving on to the next study. So is there an anthropogenic alley effect? Um, so here you see some images which come directly off Facebook. Most of these Facebook groups are open. You can go on to various pet shops on Facebook or Instagram. You can buy animals. Um, you could buy animals that are illegal. You could buy animals that are either illegally imported. I would just like to say something about CITES, the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Um, there are all primates are CITES Appendix 2, and a number of primates have been transferred to CITES Appendix 1. 
Uh, Slow loris is one of the most recent animals or primates that was transferred to CITES Appendix 1. This is not a protection law and it's not related to its red list st status. It's a trade law and it has to be, um, it has to be, how do you say, the, the, the countries who are signatories to CITES have to enforce those laws. So if you are a slow loris from Laos and you are brought into Thailand, uh, because the trade may have happened illegally, that, that's when CITES can come into play and that animal can be seen as illegal. Let's make it a more realistic example. Sonia, the tickle lover, she is a slow loris in Russia. She's a pygmy slow loris. If you go through the CITES trade database, never, even when pygmy slow lorises weren't several species, when they were all one species, never was a slow loris imported into Russia or the former Soviet Union for the purposes of pets. Even if they were illegally imported and those parents, uh, the parents of the illegal animals had offspring, all their offspring are illegal. So even if it is legal to have a slow loris as a pet in Russia, which it is legal, it is illegal if they were not imported legally through CITES. So that's where CITES plays an important role. So if you go through the CITES trade database, we can say 100% Sonia is illegal, even if she's a third or fourth generation of slow loris from illegally imported parents. And this is really, really important. Um, yeah, so what we found for sale in Thailand were 761 posts of primates and carnivores, one nearly 2000 individuals of 42 species, and already looking at these slow loris pictures, you have these very, actually they're all stressed out animals, right? Everybody's looking stressed out in these images. Um, oh, there we can see it a bit closer. And here we have uh, some native species, uh, but in particular here you have a marmoset, one of the smallest monkeys in the world, a non-native species, and easier to breed in captivity and more difficult to know when a species is captive bred um, there are other rules that apply and it may be easier to import and export. But what we also know is slow lorises are a cool example because they're almost impossible to breed in captivity and there are red light species in zoos and let's say impossible to breed in captivity to be able to be exporting 600 for the pet trade, right? That's about, that's way, way more than the whole worldwide zoo population. So here we can look at the 20 species of primates and the 22 species of carnivores uh, based on a, a model that we did to look at price. So if you see the first box in A, the non-native species are much more expensive than the native species. Um, interestingly, the species protected by Thai law are cheaper than the non-protected species. Um, when we get on to the CITES, because who really knows what CITES is anyway, uh, when they're buying things, but CITES Appendix 2 are more expensive, uh, but not really a difference between the CITES 1 and 2. But when we get on to the red list status, least concerned, near threatened, vulnerable, and endangered, endangered species are more expensive than non-endangered. So we have these non-native endangered species being the most expensive. And here we could look a little bit um, more where we look at primates in white and carnivores in gray. And we see a slight difference um, when we look at these warpa protected species in Thailand, our primates are more expensive than carnivores. And when we look at the, the threat status, again, our primates are more expensive than carnivores. So we do have this interesting anthropogenic Ali effect kind of showing its face um, in the Facebook trade in Thailand. So we move on to the last example, which is Instagram. Um, Instagram is, is now fast becoming one of the most important social media sites. It's more important for younger people. We have older people are generally using Facebook. And um, we wanted to look, yeah, at, and, and of course, Instagram is very interesting because it's a photograph that is posted instantaneously. And so it often doesn't have um, any other kind of um, context shown to it. So even if I was holding a slow loris in Indonesia with gloves on to put a radio collar on it, it could look like I had a pet slow loris, uh, or it could look like I was, I don't know, doing something with the slow loris that wasn't science. And I have to say, even in my own case as a scientist, 
when I'm going to do outreach for my university, when they want to produce a leaflet for our master's course in primate conservation, they want a photograph of me with a slow loris. They want a photograph of our student with a capuchin monkey. And, and we can see why. If we actually look at our own students who give student talks, the number of students who put a photograph of themselves with another animal that they've had contact with at a zoo or a rescue center is huge. And these are the impacts, potential impacts of these photographs. So first of all, just this interesting part of there being a slow loris trade in Turkey. This was crazy and it's new. And um, there are Bengal slow lorises and pygmy slow lorises. If we just look at the content, like if we look at some of the, the kind of uh, hashtags that are used, uh, we could see, I want one, it's so soft. Um, it has big eyes, it's cheeky, it's fluffy, I'm overexcited. Um, we have other things like Insta good or smile or it's so cute or it's my holiday. Or you could have like a nice phrase like bikini as well. If we look at those animals, um, we have most of them being pygmy slow lorises. In this case, interestingly, only about, well, 17% were in the daylight. And um, it's because most of them were out at nightclubs. A number of them were wearing human clothing and 84% were with a human woman. When we analyze these data in more detail and before the crackdowns, especially on YouTube, where you could access all the user data, which you can't do anymore, we found that the majority of people who liked YouTube videos were women in the age group of about 19 to 26. So it's young women and um, it didn't matter the country they were in, etc. So these are very appealing videos to young women. So that might be one group we want to target to try to kind of mitigate this trade in photo props and pets. Um, and actually, if you wanted, and it, when we did this study back in 2016, it cost £2.25 in UK pounds to take a photo and you could feed your Loris little like cocktail cherries from a stick, which is of course very unhealthy for them. Um, when we actually looked at those photographs and we looked at like how bright was the photograph, was the Loris in focus, uh, as expected, how good the photograph was actually taken and how many followers the people had increased, sorry, increased with a C, the number of likes. But if we look at the three photographs before and the three photographs after, photos featuring slow loris had significantly more likes regardless of their quality. So um, basically, if you have this cute exotic animal in your photo, you're gonna get more likes. Um, what's also interesting is we, we sent a lot of these data to Instagram we did a lot of petitioning with Instagram and about two or three years ago, Instagram actually put a hashtag warning for a number of, of animal hashtags. One of these was slow loris, another was sloth selfie, for example. So if you do search slow loris, it might say to you now, warning, you are gonna get, uh, you might see animal cruelty. So click if you want to proceed. This actually doesn't help us when we want to promote our wild slow loris pictures. So I've been trying to figure out what is the best hashtag I could use now when I want to inundate Instagram with wild slow lorises instead of photo prop slow lorises. And this is a challenge. So we, we try different things. But interestingly, and kind of devastatingly and depressingly, is we did another study where we looked just in Europe, because there's a lot of European tourists going to Thailand. And we looked in French, Spanish, German, and Italian. And we looked at the names of slow lorises in those um, languages. There is no Instagram warning. You go straight through to the photographs. Uh, and also the comments that are made are, um, again, like seeing 2008, 2009. It's so cute, where can I get when I want one? Whereas very often in English, the comments are more aware you should take it down, it's illegal, don't you know their teeth are ripped out? So it's evident that in every language, the same outreach needs to be done over and over again, or these social media sites need to put the same kind of warnings in all the languages that they present. Here's an interesting um, image of a girl who's got a cute post of her with a slow loris. This one has 173 likes. And what she writes is, um, had a dream about Thailand last night and woke up feeling guilty for the time I held this precious slow loris, having since learned they're hunted for illegal pet trade and their use in traditional Asian medicine. 
So why would you still post this tortured animal in the daylight with small pupils, with really poor fur condition, looking super stressed, knowing that now that you know it's illegal and now that you know they're hunted, it's because you want 173 likes on your photo. And it's a, it's a really big, big, big problem. So here we go. So those are just some results. And again, all of those studies are published. So if you'd like to read the details and the stats and the analyses, you can have a look. And quite a few of them are open access as well. But what can you do? It's, it's very difficult. We're like in a social media age and um, it's very difficult to know how we are contributing to this and uh, what we can do. So just be careful what you like. Um, and Here's a, a, a flyer that we made for, for something I do every year in October. I have an annual slow, the Slow Loris Outreach Week. And um, we try to provide all sorts of information by, uh, via our online social media platforms. And here we just spelled out Slow Loris. And for S, speak up. Um, so if you see one of these awful videos or photographs or photo props, Politely tell the uploaders why online videos are wrong or why these photo prop photographs are wrong, why they're cruel, why they're causing the species to go extinct. Um, actually, again, for slow lorises, why they're a very interesting example is trade is really one of their greatest threats. Um, they're traded in large numbers. They are slow. They can't really escape when you try to catch them. Also, when forests are deforested for, say, palm oil, it's easy to pluck out all the slow lorises that are clinging to the branches of their sleeping trees that have been cut down. They don't run away like a gibbon. They don't run away like a langur. So that, that's one reason they're so prevalent in trade. It's not because they're so common in the wild. It's because they're so easy to catch. And so it, it is an interesting case study, even though I love lorises. So speak up and politely tell the uploader why their content is wrong. Um, even on our website, we actually have a list of um, potential comments that you can make because you don't want to get into an aggressive battle with the person. You want to make them aware so they can then join sort of the battle to get these images taken down and to have people stop thinking it's a good idea to put them up. Let your friends know that wild animals are not pets. You could use Facebook banners. You could use profile photos. You know, you can, um, if they're posting these cute videos, you could let them know. You could organize an event for fundraising. You can do like films showing people this kind of stuff. Uh, you could just wear, support your favorite primates through items you wear. Uh, you can check labels, of course, for a bigger way, just how you could help animals in general, making sure the products you use aren't affecting animals like sustainable forestry products, sustainable palm oil, et cetera. Um, I, I hear I have own your own slow loris through adopting a wild one. So you could adopt an animal at a zoo. Uh, you could adopt an animal virtually. Uh, you could report animal cruelty to online sites. Uh, the more reports they get, maybe if, you tr if everybody tries it every day, they will actually learn that these things are cruel. Improve your own environmental sustainability. And for S, support your local animal shelter and ethical breeders. We don't need wild animals as pets when there are domestic varieties that are super awesome and adorable and lovely and domesticated for more than 10,000 years looking for home. So you can share helpful media coverage. It's been really great um, getting some of the, this stuff in the media here. I think you had Tara Clark Fontana speaking a few weeks ago about lemurs. This was in the news in National Geographic, why you shouldn't share this cute lemur video of an obese lemur being really miserably kind of tortured. Um, here we have, this is so wrong, animals you didn't know that you couldn't, you couldn't have as pets or you, you didn't think you could have them as pets. Um, we did some other work on owls. The owl trade throughout Southeast Asia is dramatically increasing. So um, seeing an animal in a film like Harry Potter, why do you need to have an owl as a pet? You know, it's, it's, these are the kind of things we should think about. Films are fantasy. We don't see, um, I don't know, there are plenty of things in films that we can't have in our own lives. Um, so we don't need to have these exotic pets in our own lives. And there's Jungle Gremlins of Java, the film that I did back in 2012 that had a major impact on bringing all this awareness. Um, it was translated into more than 50 languages. So there was a lot of impact from 
making a film like that. So don't be shy. If you are a young scientist, a young researcher, it can be really scary doing media for the first time um, and getting your word out there on YouTube, making your own YouTube videos, your own YouTube channel to try to counteract the material that's out there, um, talking to your own local radio stations and television stations. They love people who study primates. They tend to think it's really cool. Um, and it could be a really great way to get your message out of why these animals shouldn't be pets. One thing that's particularly interesting in India for the slender loris, that's something I didn't mention yet. There was a paper a couple of years ago in the Journal of Threatened Taxa looking at the photo, photo trade in slender lorises. And it's a very different kind of trade. Instead of those photo props where you're with a captive animal on a beach, in many parks in India, they, they take animals like the slender loris, catch a wild one, put it on a lovely branch for tourists to take photos of, and maybe just leave it there. Usually don't put it back. But first of all, you're touching the animal. You have the possibility for disease transmission. You have the possibility for stress. And if you move that animal significantly out of its home range, it may not find its way back. It may lose its family. It may lose its mates, maybe a lactating female. So there's another kind of photo prop trade that animals like lorises, which are easy to catch, are susceptible to that isn't something that is going to happen to like a, a langur. So um, on the other hand, we have animals like langurs or macaques where people are feeding them to get photos with them and they become violent, they become aggressive, they become sick, they get human diseases, they get diabetes. And so this sort of um, tourism photos are a really big problem and it's something I've personally seen in India and with the slender loris, it's a really good study that's published of that threat that's something that a tourist may not think is really wrong. So sharing this media coverage, sharing these good articles, letting your family and friends know, it's the one good thing we all can do on social media. And this is this idea of recontextualizing wild animals. I was really shocked about two years ago, I was reading just a normal columnist in, in our, our UK newspaper, The Guardian, a really good newspaper. And it was like, I love sunny days at the beach and slow loris is holding cocktail umbrellas. So there was another hideous video of a slow loris holding a cocktail umbrella that went viral. And this is like a complete decontextualization of a pygmy slow loris. This person's probably never seen it in the wild. I don't know if they know what it looks like. Here it is with a cocktail umbrella and a little like nice slice of pineapple. We actually did a neat study where we actually looked at the number uh, of slow loris tattoos online and the number of people who had lorises tattooed like this or the little tickled or the eating a rice ball where it's tortured and cruel uh, was far greater than people who had a realistic slow loris or just like a artist rendition of a slow loris. So imagine learning that this is a cruel image and you've got it tattooed on the body for the rest of your life. This is another pretty serious thing. And here you see a wild slow loris. This is Ina. She was a wild loris in Indonesia, Javan slow loris. There's Sonia, your ticket tickle lover. And then we go on to a memeization, a meme of the slow loris. Uh, your math test didn't go that well. I don't care because I'm super cute and everybody loves me. So this is no longer a slow loris at all. Um, but this is a slow loris. This is the kind of photo the newspaper doesn't want. This is how we have to watch them at night under red lights at a distance with a 300 zoom lens and a one one thousandth of a second flash. So we still get big pupils on their eyes, you know, like we don't put white lights on these animals, which we just want to watch what they do in the wild. We want to appreciate them wild and free. They have important roles as pollinators, pest controllers. They're super cool being the only venomous primate and having them wiped out so they could sit on someone's sofa and be really miserable and die at the age of three instead of 25 is really, really sad. So any ideas in the chat about how this image can be seen as more beautiful than that little loris in a meme in a rainbow, which has been shared thousands of times, um, is available on your iPhone or your phone when you go to like put in a, a little giphy kind of thing, you'll get the loris like holding his arms up, but you're not gonna get a wild loris like just blinking very cutely at you. So I think that's a pretty crazy thing. Um, you can follow Little Fireface Projects and um, you could follow our Slow Loris Outreach Week. And if there's somebody in India who wants to like, well, actually Navajit Das, who was one of my um, kind of did his PhD partially with me, and he's still doing amazing work on slow lorises in, in Assam and other places. He does a Slow Loris Outreach Week in Assam every year, for example. And um, we get a lot of 
people on board that way. So just generating interest through um, an outreach week. We have a YouTube channel. If you're interested in studying slow lorises in the wild, I'm still constantly uploading every week or every couple of weeks, the complete ethogram of the slow loris of about 50 different behaviors based on eight years of videos and photographs that we have from Indonesia, as well as other work I've done in Thailand and Cambodia and India and Sri Lanka. Um, and so we also have videos on like how to collect behavioral data. We have awareness videos about the problems of slow lorises on social media. You could share those. Um, one of them was specifically done with an amazing actress who starred in Les Miserables, for example, as she was a, a female in her early 20s and very, very popular on YouTube, a big YouTube star. So we, we thought who was better to reach out to these women in their 20s who like these videos than a woman who is very famous that uses YouTube as her platform who could speak out in favor of the so, slow lores. That's Carrie Hope Fletcher. And her video is also on our YouTube channel. As you could see from that little screenshot of our website, we have a lot of free downloadable resources. We have children's book, which you could download. Um, and I'd be very happy to have that translated into other languages. We do have it in Urdu somewhere. And uh, yeah, and also you could do all sorts of volunteering. And we have an Etsy shop if you wanna buy some cute little or stuff. And also, this is just a big issue for, for young people. This is actually a picture from my Etsy shop. And this is one of our PhD students, Elena. And that's my dog, Figgy Pudding. He's a very cute dog. They're both wearing slow loris, handmade products from Indonesia. But why not have a domestic animal as your profile picture? Why do we need pictures of ourselves holding monkeys, feeding monkeys with a baby bottle, having a monkey clinging to our neck, whatever is happening? You know, like if you, you still get a lot of like currency. We know that animal selfies with people, be they also domestic animals, get your like currency. And um, yeah, so we are all animal lovers here. So if we want to promote our animals, we should do it with domestic ones and not wild ones. And the big issue is if you do have a photograph of yourself with a wild animal that you want to show for some reason, say it's a veterinary procedure, you're radio coloring it, you're just sitting there and it happens to be behind you like a, a group of macaques on a wall, you're not in contact. It's always good actually when you post that photo to Instagram to put text on the photo so it doesn't get, get de decontextualized and you can't be blamed yourself of having that animal as a pet. Um, but do think about, especially these days, the implications of not wearing a mask, not wearing gloves. And we, we all have photos like that. Things have changed over the last 20 years. And we now have to be really careful of the way we use photos and show ourselves as scientists. And that la last statement goes as well. If you ever are involved to do a film, I can't tell you the filmmakers will want you to have a photo of yourself with the animal in some way, shape or form. And we have to decide how we as a community might go about dealing with that situation. So those are some things you could do. I'm sure you have other things you could think about doing. Um, but I would just like to thank all my funders. I'm, I'm funded by a lot of zoos, uh, which have been struggling really hard during the COVID-19 outbreak. The amazing charity in London, People's Trust for Endangered Species, uh, Disney World like Worldwide Conservation Fund and Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, the top three have funded my research every year for the last um, many years. And so um, I would also like to thank a lot of the master's students and PhD students who were collecting these data and uh, through our master's and PhD program in primate conservation here at Oxford Brooks. There's an alternative email for me there. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and on YouTube as well. And you could tweet me at Queen Fireface and we're also at Little Fireface. So here's how Loris should be. This is a boy, Aloma. There he is wild and free in his forest in Java. And somehow, hopefully, we can make that the image of a loris that people see. And thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, would it be possible for you to stop screen sharing so people can see your face? Yes. Like, there we are. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. And I think you have answered most of the questions that the uh, people have asked. But uh, nevertheless, I am going to ask you a few questions. Uh, for uh, Fitri Noor, I hope I have, uh, I hope I pronounced it correct. She's from Indonesia and she wants you to explain a few steps that an individual or an organization can take uh, again to fight back pet trade. Well, I, I suppose in, in a country like Indonesia, it would be easy, not easy, 
you can either work independently or with an organization if you see animals for sale online or animals for sale in a market to actually report that to the, the local enforcement agency. In Indonesia, it's Bake Estea. Um, you try to do that as soon as possible so the animals have a chance for confiscation or that the person has a chance to be prosecuted. It might be as well important to, one of the problems with wildlife trade in many parts of the world is that when animals are confiscated, they go to a rescue center, people may feel happy about the confiscation, but the person isn't prosecuted. So writing to your local politicians and, in, and really stressing the importance of prosecuting people who perpetrate illegal wildlife trade. I think our politicians, especially it's the best time to do this because we know with COVID-19 that this disease has come very probably from wildlife trade through wild animal vectors. We know that wet markets, that animal markets are a major cause for transmission of these diseases. And so we know that politicians are wanting to take some control of that at this moment in time. And so writing, if every person listening to this wrote their politician and asked them to take a stand on wildlife trade, they are the ones in power. Even if you go to your, your most local politician and work your way up, uh, we can start to make it a, as big of an issue. There's absolutely no reason that wildlife trade shouldn't be as persecuted as drug trade. And so you could always ask your, your local you know, authorities, well, what is your position on the illegal drug trade? Well, why, why don't you take illegal wildlife trade as serious as that? And so um, I, think, I think those are, and, and of course, all of the things I, I gave in my talk as well about your friends and family, but really politics. You also may, for example, write to the ambassador of another country. So after the issues in Turkey, we were encouraging people to write to the Turkish ambassador in the UK saying UK citizens wouldn't visit Turkey if that photo prop trade continued. So it, it's something that governments are concerned about is uh, losing their tourists. So for the, the cases where the animals are used for trade related to tourists, you can use that um, strategy as well. Oh, brilliant. It's going to be difficult for us also, but we, we Indians need to work along those lines. So uh, our next question is from Matt Wisdom. Uh, going back to the idea of celebrities perpetuating the problem, do you have any celebrities associated with the Fireface project? And do you think that it would help uh, that public perception? So we, as I mentioned in my talk, we have a, the, a celebrity, Carrie Hope Fletcher, who who did the film for us and she did a lot of social media and outreach for us. Um, we're, we're very, very small. I mean, I'm, it's basically me and my students and my team in Indonesia. So I'm not a big major NGO to be able to have a, um, a celebrity attached to me permanently, but when, when possible celebrities will retweet things for us. Um, the other person that was very, very vocal in the slow Lars cause was a celebrity called Tom Cowlitz from Tokyo Hotel. And he was the, the single person during that whole tickling slow Loris extravaganza who was the one who said it was wrong and you shouldn't have them as pets. Whereas the other celebrities said they were so cute or they did want them as pets. So we really tried to work with those celebrities, asking them to retweet things and to use their platforms to retweet. And that actually does have a good effect. I, I've had a number of, of people come back to me saying because they saw celebrities tweet, they now know that it's wrong. My favorite story, actually, I was in Heathrow in the airport and I went to like a counter to buy some, I don't know, I don't know what I was buying at some place, a shop. And a lady said, saw me wearing a slow loris necklace. And she said, oh my gosh, that's that animal that's so cute that we want to have as a pet that we shouldn't have. And I saw Carrie Hope Fletcher's video and then I followed Little Fireface Project and that's amazing that you're buying this stuff for me at the airport. So it can actually have a really big effect. Oh, wow. Uh, Gary Simpson wanted to know if there are other examples of uh, exploitation in a tourism context. Oh, gosh. Um, of, of, of lorises or of anything? Um, oh, wild, I think he's talking about slow lorises. Um, or maybe in, you can explain in terms of wildlife because there would be people working on other animals as well. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all sorts of animals that are exploited in a tourism context. I mean, the, the classic would be kind of things like elephant rides or um, these small birds you can buy that, 
that you that are released for like a prayer bird and then they're caught again and put back in the cage again over and over. Um, of course, all of the wild meat trades. Um, oh, and one of the really interesting ones. Okay, there's a great study um, about TripAdvisor and uh, it, looking at all of the tourism rate rankings of, of places you could visit on TripAdvisor. And so we know, for example, there are a lot of these tiger temples where the tigers are bred yeah. just to be in the tiger temple with their teeth cut out and they're drugged to be able to be held. And, um, and looking at you know, the comments and how we could use TripAdvisor to try to get ethical wildlife uh, destinations higher on TripAdvisor than these really depressing ones that are doing unethical things. Um, and, and again, what's very interesting, we I had another undergraduate student look at this. Um, so it's an undergraduate project, but it's a great project that could be done bigger. Was looking at Tinder, which is a dating app. Yes. And the, the one of the number one animal photographs on Tinder for young men was a photograph of themselves with a tiger at a Thai tiger farm, going like, I'm a hot guy holding a tiger. So. <laughs> they're actually using this kind of animal cruelty to attract dates. So it's a very complex situation. But I think I think practically you could go anywhere and see animals exploited in some way or animals treated in a way that we may think is appropriate or not. Okay. So uh, Francis May Tenor Tenorio has sent a comment. Uh, he would like Okay, um, have you explored the use of means for the conservation of the slow loris? I've encountered a journal article that yielded a positive response towards macaques due to memes. Yes, um, that I think was in Poland or something like that. Uh, the, the macaque one, I've seen that study. Um, yeah, so that's, we haven't in principle looked at it in a published study. We've looked at it to a certain degree and we've actually looked at our own memes so we've actually studied our own memes to find which were the best ones and which were the ones that got more likes. And, um, and I've also worked with some marketing experts who deal in the music industry about how they use memes to promote music acts. And one of the keys is that you have to change your meme every or your style of meme every few months or the public get immune to it and don't see it anymore. So you have certain memes that become viral, but not everything becomes viral, right? So yeah. it's, it's a little bit difficult. I, I think it's a study that's willing to be done. And I'm sure you've got loads of people in your audience who are looking for a project to do during COVID where they can't do field work. And so these <laughs> kind of things are a really great idea because you could do it from your own home and they have a big impact. Yeah. Probably Indians won't like a lot as a meme because it would bring bad luck to their phone. <laughs> yeah, so, um, okay. Uh, Eliza Fernandez, uh, I find it very hard to explain to my friend why someone who has a pet primate uh, but is caring for it and the primate seems to like her doing, I mean, how would she explain it to her that what she's doing is wrong and illegal? Okay, so this is an interesting question. It, not in every country, so not in every country is having a primate illegal. It is legal to have a primate as a pet in the UK, for example. Um, it's legal to have a primate as a pet, most primates in Japan, for example. And in some countries, like for example, in Indonesia, you could have certain primates as pets, again, if you purchase them legally, if they're captive bred, etc. So we, we have, it is, it is a difficult ethical question um, because sometimes we know that a private person who loves their monkey will care for it better than if it goes to a rescue center. Because sometimes the care in the rescue center, they don't have enough money or depending on the rescue center, they may be overcrowded. Um, maybe they don't have the time to give it enrichment that the person does. And so there's very little we could say from a conservation perspective, if the person is living in a country where it is legal to have the animal. And if someone were to look at that animal, like in the UK, if you have a, a monkey, there is supposed to be someone who comes in every year and checks your cage and your facilities and the welfare. So if the person has good welfare for that animal, there is probably nothing she could say to her friend. It would be a little bit different if the friend was feeding it chocolate and pizza all the time, the monkey was really fat, um, maybe was wearing nappies or diapers and was getting like 
scald on its bum, which happens all the time. Maybe it's alone most of the time and it's so happy to be with the friend because it's the only time it has human contact. But I think the, the first thing we could say about monkeys is they're social and a monkey can hardly ever be happy when it's on its own. So, um, and also it depends on the age of that monkey because when it gets older and it bites her, maybe she won't love that monkey so much anymore. So there are all the complexities of having primates as pets um, and having young primates versus old primates, small ones versus big ones. Um, and whether it's actually legal or illegal in the country where you occur. Because the, the, without doubt, there are going to be people who are very good at keeping animals as pets or anim keeping animals. You know, I've known people who have private zoo collections in their house who keep those animals very well and very ethically. And uh, if it is legal, there's very little, that's beyond my ability to say anything or give advice. Like there's nothing we could do if it's legal and they keep it well, that's, but yes. if they keep it unwell, you could give some advice. <laughs> So, uh, Kim, Kim has uh, a comment. She would uh, like you to explain to the viewers why few slides on the L L LPF, uh, LFP website and your slides had uh, slow lotuses in daylight. Um, pictures in daylight. On my website or? On the slides and the website. Um. Well, I had lots of pictures of slow lorises in daylight in this talk because I was illustrating a lot of cruel pictures. Um, there is a very famous picture we have of a slow loris, which it's a very, very pretty picture. Um, and it looks like daylight, but it's around 6.30 or 6 p.m. in the evening. And the person who took it had a 1.8 aperture on his 300 lens. And when you were there in real life, it looked dark, but the photo is really bright. Okay. And, and that photo actually causes me a little bit of problems because I know everything about that particular photo. Um, I know the individual who it is, and I remember everything about when we took the photo. And it's, uh, it's used a lot, but it looks like light, but it's actually not light. So you will see some photos we have, A, where it looks like light, B, where we just have a very good flash. We usually use two flashes to each side of the animal at one one thousandth of a second. Um, so we get really good lighting of our animals and everything's lit, lit with a red light and then flashed very quickly. So they may look like daylight, but... ...when we have, which is also around 6.30, 6 o'clock at twilight. So twilight photos could look light. Awesome. Um, Elena feels very honored to see her picture put up, Anna. <laughs> Elena, fe Elena feels very honored to see uh, her pick it up. Okay. <laughs> I hope I am clear. Uh, yeah. We still have, uh, uh, Ram, Ram has a question. We still have Indian mainstream movies that use wild animals, but lately have also been seen some outrage. I suppose there is a lot of hope for increasing awareness about using wild animals in popular imagery here. I think you've been explained this. Do you have any comments on that? I think what's interesting is um, I was going to put up Crystal the Capuchin Monkey, who's a very famous celebrity capuchin who has her own agent, agent in Facebook. So there may be some animals that are trained for the entertainment industry. In general, the entertainment industry should have standards of how those animals are treated. So maybe there is a captive animal born that is trained to be in films. But we obviously now have CGI and we have alternatives to using live animal actors. Um, and it's interesting, we actually have a student now who's looking at if CGI animals still make people want to have animals as pets, because there's evidence that it does. Let's take the film Madagascar. It's a cartoon. Oh, yeah. And it makes people want to have lemurs as pets. Correct. So, so even a, a cartoon can make people want to have an animal as a pet. Like once that, that's the anthropogenic alley effect, it comes into your notice oh, I didn't know there was a ringtail lemur before. Um, I want to have my own King Julian, you know, that kind of thing. So the, the, just being aware of these really weird, wonderful, cute, unusual animals can make people want them. And that's the danger. It's, it's very difficult. So we want people to be aware of them to save them, but we don't want people to want them. 
And I think we just need to realize, like, this is this modern society where we could have almost anything we want. And we know that as a conservationist, that's going to be destructive anyway. So we have to work on that behavior. It's not sustainable anyway, so. <laughs> so uh, Ram has another question. Have there been any attempts to use artificial intelligence or machine learning to identify wildlife pet images or videos on the internet so we can move beyond hashtags? Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do that. I actually worked with a guy who did it. Um, he, so one of the papers I did, I had a computer program programmer do that. Um, but actually, there are even programs that do it now. So there are certain programs. There's a couple of R packages that scrape comments and get all of the information and then code it for you. Um, so it, it's and, and it, it's it goes over thousands and thousands of websites, etc. So yes, that does exist. Um, it's a big data project, and and you really need to be careful because you get a lot of things that aren't relevant. So it just depends on your research question. Um, yeah, like what, if you want to look at the big picture that is available and I could probably send the link to those R packages later. Awesome. So Carlos, Jan Carlos, uh, he wants to ask, do you think, or have you some evidence of influence of official language used by each country in showing primates in social media? English has more followers than Spanish. Okay, the, the only work we did on that um, was, was a student of mine, Eleonora, we, who spoke a lot of languages. <laughs> so we, we did, oh, am I frozen? Can you hear me? We went through, we did find there were fewer posts in German, French, Italian, and Spanish, but there were still a lot, you know, so that there was, it, we didn't statistically compare how many there were to English posts. But actually, in the case of that study, there still were plenty of posts in other languages, um, particularly German. German was very, very prevalent in that study. Um, but there were, happened to be a lot of German tourists going to Thailand where we were collecting the data from. So, um, but I think that's probably something that like an advertising campaign would get access to. And then you could maybe tap in, excuse me, <coughs> to advertising to be able to answer that question. I'll give you a moment. I know. Hold on. <laughs> Ma'am, uh, you need to unmute if you're ready. You need to unmute. Oh, there, it, said, it, said the host, it said the host had to unmute me. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> um, Agus Jati, uh, he, he, I think he or she has a comment. Dear Professor Anna, unfortunately in Indonesia, there are many celebrities showing the exotic animals on TV programs and they claim it's Ill illegal. They claim it's legal? Yes, they claim it's legal. Oh yeah, yeah, this is uh, obviously. So it's a really, really big problem. Um, it's also difficult to know when it's legal or illegal. <clears throat> so sometimes, Let's take an animal like the civet cat, which is not protected in Indonesia, oh. um, but there's, there's a quota. So you can actually have it as a pet, you can sell it, but you could only sell a certain number and then you have to stop. But if you go for one month to market survey, you'll find more than the annual quota in just like one market survey. So we know the quota is superseded. So we know that a percentage of those animals are illegal. But then how do you label which one is illegal? So we have the same in, in Japan, where, for example, in the past, CITES permits didn't expire. And so you would bring in a slow loris on, uh, in 2006 before they went to CITES Appendix 1. If that animal died and you smuggled in a new one, you could just give it the old CITES permit and pretend that it was legal. So one of the changes in law they're doing in Japan is that every animal associated with a permit has a microchip. So the permit can't be used with any other animal. And that took many years for that law to, to pass. And getting a law like that in Indonesia is gonna be even harder. But I think as, as wildlife becomes scarcer and scarcer, and as we understand the ramifications of wildlife trade to human health, especially with an animal like a civet, 
which we know is a vector for SARS or, you know, it, it's, it's very, very, there are different coronaviruses as an example. That's a pretty serious animal to not keep, be keeping track of how many are in trade and how many are, who owns what, et cetera. So I, I think that might be the one thing that will help wildlife is, is when animals are linked to diseases that are really detrimental for humans. Okay, that's, yes, I think we need to know, especially if they're in stress. Uh, Rahim Saik would like you to, uh, what would you like to say about people like Kevin Richardson, Dean Shonda, as they closely live with tigers and lions, because they want to show off with tigers and lions, and sometimes this interests others to have wild animals as pets. Are those like are those um, biologists who are living with tigers, or are yes. they? Yes, yes. Oh, I, I think it's um it's very it's so tricky. I can't tell you how many times people have said I'm going to make people want to have slow lorises as pets. So I made a children's book to to teach kids about slow lorises, and there was a move to actually get it made into a major feature film. The characters. And then everyone was like, oh, but then people want to have them as pets. So it's more of about a change in our society. Like, I think that's why the, the, the moment, whoever those guys are, if you see one of their tigers with them or without them, or you see them interacting with them, or you see them studying it, or you maybe you anthropomorphize it and give it names so you could learn the stories of the families of the tiger and David Attenborough then comes and films it. And you see this lovely dynasty of that animal oh, wow, there's so much like us. I even want to have it as a pet more. So um, we have the option to have things be made illegal and to have those laws enforced. But we also, I think, just as citizens of the planet, uh, the more social media is out there, uh, like where, where we can use social media to make it a, a, a larger idea that you shouldn't have these animals as pets than you should. Because right now it's reversed. I think there's more media that you should have it, that you should have anything you want, you only live once, all that kind of stuff. I deserve it as well. She took a picture with it. She had it as a pet. I want one as well. We have to, to somehow change our thinking as humans. It's the only way because it is disastrous right now. It's a really big disaster. And what's scary about social media is we see it happening for us. And so every single time I post a photo of a slow loris, I mean, I've been told if you, if you say where your study site is, someone will go there and capture them all. <laughs> and I said, well, actually a hunter showed me where the study site was. So that's how I found the study site. The hunter already knows it's there. But, but I mean, you know, so you have that extreme where no matter what you do, you could affect those animals. Um, and we just have to try to pick where we want to sit on the spectrum. Correct. So, um, Anna, we have had lots of compliments coming in from YouTube. There are just way too many compliments for you, for me to read out each one of them. So, uh, and I guess we are also running out of, out of time. So I thank you very much for this insightful talk. It was wonderful to have you here. And I'd like to end this note by saying that this was the final talk of this series, but it, it was the best. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This is a really good way to end our series. And for people who are watching us, stay tuned. We have the next series starting soon. We would be announcing it on the website and all our social media handles. Um, Ma'am, would you have something to tell us? A final note? Oh, I, I just think that everyone who's watching has the power to make a difference. I think more than any time we've ever had in our entire lives, we're all holding a little tiny device that can kind of change the world. And it's doing that now. So we just need to make sure it changes it in the right way. <laughs>